so we can spread. So I will now hand over to Simon, who will give a proper introduce, introduction to, um, to um, Lucy. Sorry, my screen disappeared then, so let's hope that's not a sign. Um, and um, at, at the end of their conversation, we'll have some time to speak all together. Okay, thanks, Simon. Thanks, Kate. Uh, I've, never, I've never asked for this to happen before, but do you think you should spotlight uh, Lucy and me? Uh, very diplomatic, because that's something I said I'd do 10 minutes ago. And, <laughs> and then I can hide self-view. So I am now going to spotlight Simon and Lucy. Okay, great. Great, thanks Kate. So hi everyone, I'm Simon Ellis. I'm a researcher and artist here at the Centre for Dance Research. My expertise is really in choreographic practice, uh, improvisation, and in research centred around practice. My expertise is definitely not AI or machine learning or large language models, etc. Um, and it's my a tremendous pleasure to welcome you, Lucy, uh, Lucy Suchman, to CDR Invites. Uh, Lucy is an anthropologist working at the intersections of, of the fields of anthropology and social science and social and tech, uh, sorry, science and technology studies. Uh, she's written exclusively on human-like machines and human understanding of being with machines. Lucy's also looked critically at AI systems in the military in which human life, I'm quoting you here, Lucy, human life is reduced to sensor data and machine processing. It's such a pleasure to e-meet you, uh, Lucy. Thank you, it's, it's great to be here. So we've, we've, we've prepared by uh, sending back and forth things to, to read and look at, look at, but this conversation itself is not planned. Um, so we're going to see how it goes. Uh, I should, I think it's worth acknowledging at this, uh, just initially, just how much is being spoken and written about AI at the moment and how over overwhelming it is, or at least it might feel for people. And because this is a dance research event, we will do our best. I'm just, I'm pushing this on you now, Lucy, but you might disagree. We'll do our best to stay close to ideas that relate broadly speaking to the body, the body in motion. But please do forgive us if we stray off course, that might well happen. Have I missed anything there, Lucy, do you think? Yeah, no, that, that um, I, I mean, the, the series is titled The Body and AI, as I understand. Uh, and um, and I'm I'm glad. I think that's a really good reminder because one can get down a lot of rabbit holes uh, in talking about AI. And at least we only want to go down the ones that um, seem relevant and interesting to people. And um, so yes, I'm with you on that. Great. So maybe I can start with what I think. I don't know. I hope it's a I hope it's a fair question. Um, but. How, how is it that you would describe your relationship to your body? And I guess you can engage whether you like it or not with who the your is in that question. Mm -hmm. um, when I say your body, uh, I, how is it that you think about your body or describe your relationship to your body? Oh, well, that's a, a wonderful and unexpected question. <laughs> um, and uh so, you know, I, when you ask me that question, I realize, and this is going to uh, make it clear that I'm not a dancer, um, because I immediately adopt a kind of autobiographical um, stance when, when I hear that question, right? And so I, I, imagine, um, I imagine myself slash body uh, as I have, um, you know, traveled uh, through the world. And of course, in this context in particular, I sort of think about how I came into relationship with the topics that we're talking about. Mm. Um, but, but I think um, perhaps like many, um, I'll, I'll say academics, that's, that's a, a very broad category, but people who spend most of their time um, sitting at their desks, <laughs> um, my practice, I would say, uh, actually, my, my partner has characterized me as an indoor cat, 
So perhaps that says a lot, <laughs> um, you know, because my own embodied practice um, is, is really tremendously um, happens in a kind of, you know, imaginative space. Um, mm. and, and of course, that saying that, I, I, I think actually brings us directly into the topic for today, because where is that imaginative space, mm. right? Um, I think part of what we're what we're dealing with now is that is that imaginative space in the worlds that I've been following um, is inside our heads, right? Inside our skulls, and um, and a lot of what um, practice oriented um, research, science and technology studies, uh, feminist theory have been about is redrawn. Um, that space and that undoubtedly uh, connects, I think, with 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 your work. And so, you know, in terms of science and technology studies, emphasizing sociality, relations, and also materiality, um, and uh, trying to um, undo that the boundaries of that Cartesian um, mind, uh, and. So that's certainly, um, you know, I think of of my body in those in those relations. Um, and when I say that I spend, a, when I you know that I spend a lot of time in this this kind of um, imaginative space, it is it is a a thoroughly um, social and material <laughs> kind of of um, of lived um lived imaginary i would say so i don't know maybe that's the beginning of an answer uh, mm. anyway it's um, i'm i guess in, i'm you know in hindsight all of five minutes ago or three minutes ago it's um because i think it's probably a question that people involved in dance are, you know we're dealing with um very early on uh how it is that we relate to our bodies um but it's really interesting that you said you talked about you talked about your practice being social imaginative existing in imaginative spaces but also being social and material it seems like mm -hmm. there's there's a there's some kind of paradox going on there in terms of what 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 material something being material might mean that mm -hmm. the imagination can be in a, a material space can you talk mm -hmm. about that a little more Sure, sure. I mean, th there are so many ways that we could talk about it. And, you know, one of the, I guess, interesting things is perhaps the differences in the ways that we that we would talk about that. But, um, you know, for me, it's an appreciation for the extent to which um, whatever you know, this this tr tremendously strong tendency um, that we that I'm going to say we have, but I think particularly those of us who who aren't dancers, who aren't um, haven't been kind of steeped in in thinking about about the body, um, that that the the tendency to conceptualize and and even when I say conceptualize, you know, I'm going to kind of gesture towards my head, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's such a powerful tendency, and yet. Um, Everything that I, in, first of all, I'm acutely aware of the material bases of my um, being in the world, uh, even when I'm when I'm sitting at my desk. I mean, specifically when I'm sitting at my desk, where I think mm -hmm. of the material bases as the texts. You know, of course, the kind of kit that enable you know that enables us to be talking now. Um, those those are all of those arrangements and infrastructures. But also the texts um, that inhabit uh, my hard drive, um, but that are you know incredibly lively for me, and their liveliness is because of the ways in which they bring me into relation with their authors, um, with that that which is being written about, um, and so, and at the same time, I will say that I think a lot in part because I've been recently engaged in critical work on uh, the data-driven uh, in moves toward increasingly data-driven uh, intelligence um, making in the military. Um, I think a lot about 
uh, questions of how um, we what how we are in relation and the difference between um, reading and and encountering uh, mm. different realities and and of course the um, the the kind of violences of abstraction and datification and I was I, I was in I came to the session with Kate and Harmony and the the idea of visceral data I think is just tremendously interesting and so I worry a lot about how different relations of, of, let's say, proximity and distance, um, and also different renderings of, um, you know, of, of the other, of, of places and events um, matter for how we know them. And, you know, I think about what it means for me to be sitting in the comfort of my, um, my study, uh, in, you know, engaging in some sense, and you can see I want to put that in quotes, um, engaging with matters of, of life and death, right? In, like there's just a profound kind of paradox um, in that, I think, that, that I'm, I'm very aware of and, and, and feel as a, in a way, a kind of moral dilemma that, um, that uh, yeah, anyway, that's... Mm. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, it's really I uh, so many things, so many little sort of doorways there for me to um, enter into. Uh, I think uh, I, I guess I'd like to say that I'm academically ambivalent about the kind of the reification of the human body and the body in motion and that we in dance tend towards that is, you know, and it's for obvious reasons, it's our, uh, our bread and butter, our lens. Um, you might say that it's, it, sometimes it feels to me a little bit that regardless of the question, that the, the, mm. the, the correct answer is the body. Uh, and much <laughs> like, um, you know, the cognitive science I read, it seems to me that it doesn't matter what the question is, the answer these days it seems to be dopamine. Um, it was extraordinary how much that particular chemical seems to be flying around the world at this, in this time. And um, and I, I want to address this, this subject ob object thing, which is which is in the you know it says it on the tin in terms of this particular talk. Yes. Uh, but I definitely want to return back to these abstractions that you were just talking about and and the kind of the moral implications of those abstractions. Um, through your work and thinking about the nature of AI in relation to the military. But so I'll just park that uh, yes. for a moment. Yeah. I actually have a, a background as a as an athlete before I started dancing. So I in 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 biomechanics actually. So I came from a kind of Newtonian physics uh, background. And there's no question that in that training, uh, I was a tennis player, that the body is a kind of system of 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 subdividable parts of of levers and axes and ropes and pulleys. And even the mind, you might say, was treated um, as a thing to be optimized through sports psychology. And I, I guess I have a proposition which maybe will be may not be surprising to you but it might be to to other people in this particular zoom that is i have a feeling that much dance training is similar that's it's similar or akin to that it's about optimizing or mastering the body as an object to be controlled coordinated um, displayed or as a kind of container for expressive potential and that even in in what we call somatic dance practices, which are um, the, the idea of the body is observed from the inside, you know, the question of who's doing that observing, like what who's responsible for those observations, that that sense of it being this divide is hard to shake. This this very clear um, uh, subject object divide. And I guess my, and also recognizing that in terms of human development, the idea of objects that are graspable, that are able to be manipulated and to orient oneself to objects is a, an incredibly fundamental part of how we develop as human beings. And I guess my, my I, I, if I can pose this as a question is, and, and forgive me if the question is a little bit, you know, 
strange, but what do you imagine AI or what do you think AI does perhaps with respect to robotic systems have to tell us about this divide, this subject yeah. object divide? That is that there is an I, a self as subject observing, manipulating, etc., calculating, um, including the body itself whether that body is machinic or biological. So what's your sort of, how do you, how do you enter that, that world of this divide? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that there's, there's a lot in there. Um, so I, I think what partly what you're pointing to uh, goes back to what I described as how deeply ingrained the location of um, the, the eye is in the head <laughs> mm. and uh, and that is, so there, that on the one hand and on the other, the kind of object, the objectivist, um, the objectivist epistemologies that we, you know, that, and, and here I'm saying we who have grown up within the legacy of Western rationalist, um, modernist thinking, um, the privileging of uh, the conscious eye, the observer eye, and the location of that observer eye in, in, the, in the head, uh, in the brain, um, and the instrumentalization of the relations of that observer eye with everything else, right? Um, that's, that is the, the subject in Western sort of Cartesian, <laughs> uh, that, at that observing eye. Um, and and its purpose is an instrumental one, right? And just as you were describing, its purpose is control, its purpose is um, you know, object manipulation. Um, uh, and so, so all of that, I think, is part of what um, is, you know, we're, we're now engaged in questioning. And I can imagine something that in dance. And you and you uh, talking about your shift from from biomechanics into into dance as a different way of of drawing the lines of the body and thinking about the body. Um, that you know, and I think, I mean, anthropologically, I think we should not overestimate the extent to which um, the observation that humans. Um, have an important relation to, to objects doesn't necessarily mean that it's that that relation is the same for all humans right and I think mm. that we are again you know those of us brought up in, in the kind of European tradition um you know we are taught very early on that we are separate <laughs> from the world around us um that you know that objects are things to be manipulated uh and and it and it 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 can be and and undoubtedly is otherwise in other places. So so to bring this back to AI, um, you know, and, and and the subject objects in our in our the, the label on our tin, as you said, um, refers to the paper that I wrote uh, for the journal Feminist Theory, um, where I'm reflecting on uh, the ways in which humanoid robots. Um, are their indicators of conceptions of the human um, that are being mobilized in their making. And, and um, so the paper is, is part of a kind of continuing exploration of what is that conception of the human, that the human-like machine, you know, what is the sense of human-like um, there? What can we learn about that by, by seeing how roboticists um, understand and 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 model the human in their machines, and also the ways in which machines um, exert their machineness. <laughs> and and you know, for me, um, I've been I've been tracking closely because it, it, much as um, a lot of work in in science and technology studies and a lot of the work that I admire is about uh, working against kind of human essentialism and undoing, mm -hmm. you know, as I was saying earlier, undoing that separation and that, that sense of essential difference between us and the, and the, the object worlds that, it, that we inhabit. Um, when engaging with AI, um, 
I've found myself coming back again and again to the question of what are the differences that matter um, between us and our machines? What, what does it mean to be a subject, um, to, to have a, a subjectivity, to, uh, to inhabit the world as, a, as an organic, <laughs> organically embodied subject? Um, and what are the limits to which that can be reproduced in the kind of you know mechanical um, with, within the constraints of of the kinds of materialities that that computational machines are, um, and so in the paper subject objects, I'm I'm exploring um, different encounters uh, with between humans and human like robots, and um, and the the title in a way comes. Uh, first from, from the first um, case in the paper, um, which is this wonderful uh, YouTube. Well, I happened to be visiting it at MIT. Uh, this was back in 2009, I think. And, and the, this, um, the, the MIT AI lab had, had set up a robot in the kind of atrium of the computer science building. And this was framed as a, you know, the roboticists are, um, and, and people in cognitive science are very fond of talking about in the wild. Um, <laughs> and in very the wild. wild, MIT is the wildest yeah. place. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so this robot was in the wild because it had been moved out of the laboratory into this public space, right? <laughs> um, and, the, you know, the, we could say a lot more about that from a kind of anthropological <laughs> perspective, but, um, but it, you know, it, in, the, in the course of, of this, um, this little experiment, uh, a few people who encountered the robot, um, one of them, of course, had a phone and made a video of their encounter and posted it on YouTube. And I completely fell in love with this, um, with this video. And I do a little analysis at the beginning of the paper, thinking about, about getting away from the idea that subject and object is a kind of inherent identification. Mm. to the idea that you, these are fleeting, these are positions, these are, they're dynamic. And I actually use the word choreograph um, in talking about that encounter. Um, these are, uh, although of course it's also, well, it's, we could talk about the ways in which it is and isn't improvisational, but, but you, you can, I, I talk about the, the ways in which um, the, in the course of this encounter, subject and object positions get get done, get enacted. Um, mm. Now, I think they are enacted differently. I think that the humans in the encounter, I'm interested in the ways in which they shift, they, they enact the robot as a subject, alternately as a subject and an object. And I try to talk about how those shifts happen. The robot I describe as basically for the robot, these are these are objects emitting signals that its sensors are able to detect, and those sensors are then you know, and that those signals are then being translated through the inbuilt its inbuilt it's process. Robot subjectivity. Yeah. So so I feel you know robots um, robot subjectivities uh, are <laughs> you know I'm hesitant even to make that attribution because this is where you know I do think there are differences that matter and all of it, you know, there's this amazing resurgence right now of discussion about artificial general intelligence. And I just find this extraordinary because um, there, you know, AI, the, the AI project is no closer to that than it's ever been, which is nowhere. <laughs> and, and, you know, for reasons we could, we could talk about, um, but it's a tremendously compelling um, uh, project for people working in AI and robotics. And, um, mm. and, it, and it includes this idea of machines acquiring a kind of, of, of subjectivity, uh, mm. consciousness. Uh, you know. Then we get into discussions about should they have rights? And so anyway, perhaps there are people here who, who are more um, compelled by those <laughs> discussions than I am, but it's, I'm very um, skeptical. 
Yeah, yeah, I can hear that skepticism. Uh, <laughs> for my sins, I I read um, Nick Bostrom's book, Superintelligence, um, and it was a strange experience because of the, and not least because of the, uh, I'm just going to say the tone and and the sort of matter of factness of this um, this you know post uh, uh, artificial general intelligence uh, moment or explosion, and there, there was something very odd to uh, about my experience of reading this book. Um, but it makes me it makes me uh, I'm not sure I'd recommend it for those of you who haven't read it. But anyway, um, I, do, do you think if you're touching on this? Do you think Hmm. Uh, I do you think humans are special? <laughs> um, no, I absolutely don't think humans are special. I think I think humans are well uh, any more than anything else is special. I mean, if we're using the word special to say that differently, um, that you know, first of all, this is all about categories, right? I mean, we have we have we have constituted the human as a category of animal, <laughs> a distinctive category of animal. Um, and so, you know, I think we're animals first and, and foremost. Um, and, and, and we're animals who over a very long period of time have, you know, developed in, in specific and, and distinctive ways um, and, and are of course continuing uh, to change. And so, uh, you know, this, as I say, on the one hand, I'm, I'm all with the project of moving away from any kind of human exceptionalism, which yeah. is, you know, part of the colonial project that, um, you know, that much of, of the other things that we've been talking about are, are, are part of as well. Um, but when it comes to having, you know, spent a good part of my, of the last 40 years in engagement with people working in artificial intelligence, um, I find myself again being concerned with articulating um, what I think are differences that matter specifically between humans and computational machines. Um, and, and I think it's crucial to remember that unlike, you know, there are also many comparisons with animals. Um, when people in the AI are talking about the, the, the you know the development of, of their machines, they they often compare them. You know, if they're not comparing them to a two year old child, they're comparing them to you know a dog. Or and and I think that is is just as problematic. <laughs> I think comparing you know machines to, to dogs is just as problematic as comparing them to people because for me the important the, there's an important difference. Um, be, be, between uh, artifacts, things that are constructed by us and, and, I, and for which then we have a particular responsibility mm. um, and the, the rest of the more than human world, the, the organic world, we just came into being in different ways and, and are configured differently um, in, our, in our materialities in, in ways that I think matter. And so, yeah, so in that sense, um, I guess I, it's not so much that I think humans per se occupy some special place in the universe, but I think that, we're, you know, and, and there's so much difference within that category, but, but I think the difference between the organic and the, and the inorganic and within the inorganic between things that are made by us and things that come into being in other ways. We just need to be attending to and respecting those different genealogies and, and um, the, the, their implications. For and is the implication is the implication there that we haven't been respecting those genealogies or those those as you described differences that matter? Yeah, well, I think it's part of the hubris of the, you know the the master <laughs> human. The, the master human that you were describing, you know, who controls their their own body, um, that that is part of that hubris um, to to want, you know, I mean, feminist critics have accused, you know, the AI project as being sort of male male birthing, you know, male parthenogenesis, but the idea of of, of this of, this obsession 
with creating something in your own in your own image. And of course, mm -hmm. that's where we go back to the question of okay, who are we really talking about here? Um, then you know, I, I think that um, that is part of the hubris. It's part of um, it's 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 integrally tied up with, with the whole project and, and part of part of the problem. So yeah, I, I wanted to go back because I didn't want to lose the subject to object question in relation to, to dance and the body. And so I wondered if you could talk a bit more about, about how that comes up. Um, yeah, it, it comes up. Your yeah, it comes up because it, um, on a very, very, uh, well, I'm going to talk about a very specific practice, which is, uh, so it's not for performance. So it's, uh, that, that that, that's an entire world when you ask other people to uh, to not necessarily pay, but to come and look at uh, someone or yourself or whoever doing some dancing is a um, there's something about the um, you know that that sort of simple idea that self consciousness is a curious word we use when it's really the the recognition that someone else is looking at us uh, yes. that it's it's sort of something other than self consciousness, but. And I think the thing that I'm most interested in at the moment is the is things is uh, practices that are much closer to what would be described as non-dual awareness. So um, things that are much closer to meditation practices, in which um, the the body as a as as it's directly experienced is is very simple in the sense of it's I can feel them now of of pressure of temperature of um, of friction of at a at a at a very fundamental level those things are that's in a kind of an incredibly rich. Uh, uh, let's say stream that's related to to consciousness that is that these the sort of sensory systems of the body before they are labeled before I label them as being something um, and so the kinds of improvisation practices which are dealing with things that are um, uh, that don't that are, as I say they're they're non-dual they're not subject they don't fall into that subject object kind of world and of course partly because you know humans we do what we do that the kind of sense of um of recognizing a thing to be a thing for example uh a memory of something so i might be dealing with uh, uh let's say the body or oh, so the language is so strange but <laughs> being in the body uh anyway um yeah <laughs> uh that that uh that this this particular kinds of uh, sensations uh, as a matter of direct experience might prompt me to think or remember something or imagine something else so that so that my sense of being as you described it this uh this as if it's happening here this imagining yeah. and this um or remembering uh is draws me into the world of subject object and so the challenge becomes like it is in meditation practices to go back to the direct experience so the pre I'm not sure and it's something about the labeling which is mm -hmm. um which of course ties beautifully to uh <laughs> I really would love to talk about mechanical Turks but uh maybe we won't have time for that but um, but that sort of sense of labeling and the resisting or the noting that labeling is happening to return back to things as a matter of direct experience. I don't know if that, that yes. sort of, that's a sort of sense of that kind of world in terms of my curiosity. Yes, absolutely. No, that that is very directly aligned with with the questions of of this this idea of trying to understand that the the enacted the enacted nature of subject object positions and how much that's informed by the the resources of of language and and categorization that are available to us for better and worse right so that we um, you know the the skin are, is the boundaries we think about the insides and the outsides of the body, and that practice that you describe is about um, ways of re 
reconfiguring that those those boundaries and and trying to understand the dynamics of of that experience yes in a, in a way that's not bound by those sorry yes and i think that's something which i find uh uh kind of remarkable in the sense that it's it, where it is that to locate those things um and so if i think about if i think about my uh you know conceptually what we describe as a hand uh i can talk about which is a quite a fixed thing that is we can and humans are unlike uh um uh, AI or intelligences are very, they're not so great at picking out those kinds of things, which are quite so obviously, well, actually, clearly, they're improving tremendously at that in this time, but that at the level of direct experience, the things that are going on in that, let's say, part of my body are these very basic things in terms of temperature and pressure and, and friction. And, and yet, there's something about the rigidity. Uh, and, and those things are uh, those things are constantly in motion. Those those direct experiences are constantly in flux. And there's something about the rigidity of the concept, the human concept of the hand in this yes. case, which is exactly. it's a, it's a very peculiar kind of thing where one is quite boundaryless, that the fact yes. that it's a hand is irrelevant. Um, and then also the pragmatic aspect of that, which is it's quite useful to be able to describe this part of my body as a hand in order to communicate, exactly. to, try to point to it and all those things. So there's yeah. something there's something kind of, yeah, the sort of tension there or the paradox of those things, which I which I think is, um, which I take a lot of pleasure in. Yeah, no, that's so interesting. And I mean, that is the, 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 the lived hand and the kind of anatomical hand. Um, and, you know, a couple of, of, of thoughts on that. I mean, one of the, the, the canonical texts in science and technology studies is a book um, titled Sorting Things Out, Classification and Its Consequences by Jeff Bauer and Lee Starr, which is a, a brilliant um, analysis of, of categorization and, and, and the work that it does and its, um, its genealogies in in the uh, the kind of masteries that are part of the classificatory sciences and so forth, and of course, you know, anatomy is one of those moments where the body gets taken apart and categorized, and um, and at the same time, you know, the lived hand, as you describe it, um, as part of the body. And one of the interesting things about if you look at robotic hands, um, and and the, you know, the, there there has been a realization of the complexity of of touch and of the, the importance of touch in the capacities of hands to to do you know the, to operate in the ways that they do, um, but the the, the progress um, in that direction is literally you know it, it will be a body a, a body part. So you have a robot hand, <laughs> just it's not part of a, <laughs> and and then and then all of the focus is on the grasping the ability of that hand to, to yeah. grasp right. Yeah. Um, and so it's very action, very action oriented, or it's, it's it has an objective. There is a particular it's, it, objective. Exactly. It's, it's very instrumental. And to the extent that uh, things like that you were talking about, the you know, friction, touch, the different elements of 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 the the, the capacities of hands come Experience, in. Yeah. They come in in order to in support of, in order to enable that instrumentality to be more effective um, mm. and and so in you know i think even analogizing that to a hand to the hand itself is you know one of those sort of elisions um you know it's a kind of sleight of hand <laughs> to make a pun you know of, of which ai is just full right and yep. and not and, and in part because that is what fuels the kind of imaginative um uh project of, of robotics uh, it's not just kind of for public consumption but but it's um it's part of what i think is um the the very um enormous mystification of, of these technologies the sort of invitation to project these our our experiences of the body mm. onto them yeah it strikes me that 
well just thinking about categorization um and it strikes me there's something which i which i think is uh i, I think i which i think is overwhelming or let's say i find overwhelming and that is the the kind of extraordinary uh difference in scale between the possibility of having a I'll say embodied experience. I, I, I'm a little always a bit again, that's another sort of door to, to enter, but let's say that um as a shorthand, that as that these things that are being that I'm directly or that a dancer is directly experiencing before categorizing or before labeling, all the way up to this uh these extraordinary neural networks which are billions and billions and billions of data points which are uh, some of which depending on whether they're supervised or not are being labeled um, by hand again strangely we use that kind of language by yeah. human beings labeled by human beings and then others which are, seem to be increasingly um, uh, learned by uh, um, or again, even that word is strange, that are somehow yes. developed in time through reinforcement, et cetera. Yeah. But there's something about the the enormity of that scale from the the pre-label to the the sort of sense of this massive machine, this machine that you're, you know, more directly yeah. or very directly involved in, which I'm uh uh I, I guess I struggle with, and I'm, yes. I'm really curious to hear about that that sort of sense of how we how how do we manage these bodies, these little bodies in that world, which is effectively a a body, meaning in, other than body. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, but of course, those you know those systems are bodies also all the way through, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, you you. you mentioned um this wonderful piece by kate crawford and blood into their anatomy of an ai system right which is um, yeah yeah so recommend it if you if people who yeah are um, so there you know there are bodies all over the place um in these systems but i think this is one of the the, the big concerns um that you know it goes back to that old um the old adage if, if you have a hammer everything is a nail well now you've got this incredible compute power and data storage capacity. And so everything is, is a data point. And, and that means that, you know, these are very powerful technological solutions now searching for their problems and, and, you know, quite relentlessly um, translating, translating worlds into into data uh, mm. in order that they are amenable to being you know incorporated um, into that machinery and so so it and these are categorization machines right so this is part of what i think we need to be um why i think we need to be skeptical and also actually pushing back on the scaling up and the the growth of of this industry is that because it is a categorization machine and it it further in, entrenches um, the systems of categorization um, mm -hmm. that are available, and we know how problematic that is, and uh, the kind of discriminatory effects of of the of the those systems of categorization historically, and as they are being perpetuated and 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 amplified um, by these um, by these machine learning systems and i think you know you're corrected yeah. to that to um that that they're basically uh the their output is being assessed and and for for its correctness by humans and then that's their iter you know they're, they're given an objective function by humans and then they're iteratively optimizing um to, to reach that function um that that's not not i think something that should be called learning <laughs> which is another yeah, conversation yeah, yeah. but it, you know it takes us back to this you know the points at which i want to to defend um the the kind of specificity of of these processes that that as as they um happen it, for, for organic um, beings rather than machines 
Um, but yeah, I think, you know, putting that you, you've, you've, you've really put your finger on part of a big issue and, and a big part of the problem here, which is that, that as much as we, you know, as much as your work um, is about uh, recovering and, and, um, and in some ways um, putting forward that space of experience that happens before things get categorized. Mm. Um, that space is, we need to hold that space open and it's being further closed um, by, by this incredible uh, investment in computation that mm -hmm. we're now, mm -hmm. that we're now experiencing and, 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 um, and, you know, I think, well, yeah, just sort of drawing so many resources and, and injurious in so many ways. So, mm. yeah. Is this, a, maybe this is, I mean, we probably, is it, I mean, I, there's a little bit I'd like to talk about very briefly in relation, maybe we could finish with that about embodiment, but just before that, there's something about situational awareness, which I, which, you know, we, which you sort of briefly mentioned in relation to um, uh, the sort of the abstractions and the, the moral aspect of abstractions when it comes to mm -hmm. AI. And, and I'm, if it's okay, I'm, I'm going to just uh, um, uh mention something something you wrote in a in a paper from last year called imaginaries of om, 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 omnis omniscience. omniscience omniscience i don't yeah. think i've ever yeah. said that word out loud um oh well good for you <laughs> <laughs> uh automating intelligence in the u.s department of defense and you talk about situational awareness in the ooda loop uh which which is something I read about years ago and was really, and I think there's something about my teenage boyness, which I really loved. Like there was something about the, the real clarity of that kind of world that I really enjoyed. And it yeah. was military related. And you talked about situa situational awareness regarding closed and open worlds. And I, I could you, I know this is a. You, could you talk about what that what those worlds mean, closed and open worlds, and why they might matter to bodies? You, you might mention the loop or you might not, but people can look it up. It's O O D A if you're, yes. you're desperate. Yeah, yeah. So the UDA, UDA stands for Observe, uh, Orient, Decide, and Act, um, and it is part of a kind of cognitivist, uh, cybernetic model of co of, of cognition. Uh, that is very um, popular since about the, since the, the early 90s um, in the military uh, as a way of, of translating, of, of basically turning, um, you know, of, well, of basically imagining the war machine as a machine um, from the individual soldier through to the whole yeah. command and control structure. Yeah. And, and I sort of, in, 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 my engagements with with AI in the military, which really come out of my, you know, the fact that I'm an American citizen and I grew, up, I came of age in the 1960s, and you know, so this has been a, a lifelong um, preoccupation. Um, but I, I kind of, I was, I was very intrigued by the trope of situational awareness, which is absolutely central to mm -hmm. military um, doctrine, training, etc. And it's, you know, the idea of how you know what's going on around you. And more specifically, in the case of, of, of the military, um, very importantly, it's about the distinction between friends and enemies, which is absolutely fundamental to, to, to the whole uh, enterprise. And that's part of the problem, of course. Um, and then the closed and, and open worlds, the closed world comes from the a book by that title, an amazing book by um, Paul Edwards, looking at the the way the the relations between um, Cold War military thinking and computation, um, and the uh, the the closed world imaginary of the Cold World War being this projection of a you know a, it's it's referred to as the the dome of, of global technological oversight so you have this kind of that that's where the omniscience comes in wow. this it's this dream where 
you the world is fully instrumented with sensors and you are either as the, the commander, you are sitting at your dashboard and you're getting real time. Um, now they talk about it as sensor to shooter um, mm. intelligence coming in. And but but it is this, it's it's about the command and control structure um, of the military. And it requires the 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 aspiration, I guess, the belief in the possibility of sustaining a kind of closed cybernetic um, <laughs> infrastructure. Uh, Predictable and, and yes, yes, where 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 everything, you know, it's a it's a, a thoroughly kind of objectivist um, view where where you know the world is kind of giving off its its signals which are being picked up by your sensors. And, um, it, it erases, of course, all of the, the absolutely irremediable um, indeterminacies, ambiguities of, of, of what, what, you know, what I would call the open world. Um, and this goes back directly to how we think about, um, you know, it goes back to improvisation. It goes back to how we think about being in the world and that um, rather than us being these um, en entities with our sensors who are sort of receiving signals from the world and processing them and then responding um, accordingly. Um, you know, uh, as Karen Barad, who's a very wonderful feminist um, physicist and, and science and technology studies um, person says, you know, we are part of the world's becoming, that mm -hmm. we're not we're not sort of outside the world, but we're not inside it. We are, <laughs> we are enacting it. Um, so, so it's a much more uh, performative uh, um, understanding of, 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 of the, the way the real is being done um, by us and what our responsibilities are for that. Um, but that kind of indeterminacy, and, and when I look at, um, at AI systems, um, I'm always looking, I believe that they all require the containment of the worlds in which they operate. I mean, self-driving cars are a great example. They were they were imminent. Now, oh, it's a bit harder than we thought. And you know, it's increasingly clear that autonomous vehicles are only going to be possible to the degree that the world can be engineered to make it safe um, for them uh, mm -hmm. to operate in. And you know, the, the assembly line is the perfect, you know, sort of closed world example where. The, the robot and its world get engineered in relation to each other, right? Mm. Um, and uh, although even there, we know that that is sustained by an enormous amount of ongoing human labor. Um, so, so, you know, those, those supposedly closed worlds are not themselves closed, but they are contained sufficiently so that these systems can operate. And I have yet, to encounter uh, an AI or robotic system that doesn't involve um, the containment um, of, of its worlds in mm -hmm. some way, whose effectiveness is not reliant on that kind of containment. And I, I don't think that's the way um, we, as, as the kinds of animals that we are, <laughs> um, in, inhabit our worlds. Uh, it's it is really even like for me just the language the the, the language of containment is um, extraordinary. Not I mean certainly improvisation. I think we we overestimate how open it is in the sense that you know it's still it's restricted by the mechanics of of a body of an aging body of um, of training of uh, of all sorts of uh, uh, psychological predilections and physical predilections etc. So there's something there's something there's some lines there about the language of containment and, and openness which is deeply fascinating to me can i can i can i think maybe we should i, I want to just finish with one thing if that's okay um and then we can so that we can get other people yeah. into this conversation and so there's someone who you you will have heard of uh and who was a new name to me marvin minsky um marvin minsky was uh, uh sorry about this you're probably you can, i can imagine you're rolling your eyes but um no, one no, of the, no. the fourth one of the grandfathers i guess is the word of, of ai was at that original meeting in where was it in dartmouth in the 50s yeah. and yeah. 
very famous uh, summer camp they had, and um, he described the human brain, I'm just going to read a little bit here, as nothing more than a meat machine, and regarded the body, that, quote, bloody mess of organic matter, as a teleoperator for the brain. I mean, it's great language, you have to admit. He both, he insisted, were eminently replaceable by machinery. And that what is important in life, he argued, is mind, which he defined in terms of structure and subroutines, that is programming. And so I think I was, I'm being a bit mealy mouthed before about embodiment. And I, I like to think of it as the recognition, it's the recognition of, of an illusion. And the illusion is that it is possible for me, for me to leave my body and I would still be me. That's how I understand embodiment. It's like it's the body being known. And then just to, and then and another person who became probably familiar to you, Andre Carpathy, wrote a very well-known blog post in 2012. Carpathy is a he's the former senior director of AI at Tesla. Um, he wrote a blog post titled "The State of Computer Vision and AI: We Are Really, Really Far Away." And he says this: a seemingly inescapable, an inescapable conclusion for me is that we may need embodiment and that the only way to build computers that can interpret scenes like we do is to allow them to get exposed to all the years of structured, temporally coherent experience we have, the ability to interact with the world, some magical active learning inference architecture that I can barely even imagine, still quoting him when I think backwards about what it should be capable of. And assuming that that hasn't changed, that Andre hasn't changed his mind in the last 11 years, that there's some kind of accuracy, that to even to spend time imagining that it's accurate, how might, how might our sense of the construction or development of intelligence, <laughs> we didn't really talk about what that is, but about the development of intelligence shift or expand from the brain as equivalent to mind, to something which human intelligence is embedded in the world and afforded through action and movement. Can you imagine such a shift? It seems like that in relation to AI, we are really, really far away. And I wonder what you, what's your feeling about the possibility of that kind of, what would be a radical shift in how it is that the people responsible for this machinery uh, uh, um, uh, would occur or might happen? I don't, I don't think question, sorry. Gonna, yeah, I don't think it's going to happen um, among the artificial intelligence yet. <laughs> uh, yes. I mean, I think I, I think it is it had it has happened. Um, uh, you know, I, I think about um, uh, at, within anthropology, feminist theory. Uh, I think there have been radical uh, re-articulations of intelligence. Um, in, in relation to ideas of practice. So I think about the work of Jean Lave, um, who wrote a wonderful book, Cognition and Practice, uh, and, um, and also famously um, at Hutchins, who wrote, uh, well, interestingly, his book is called Cognition in the Wild. <laughs> um, but, but it's, it's uh, again, um, looking at the social and, and, and material um, relations that constitute uh, intelligence. So it's that kind of decentering um, uh, of intelligence that tr translation into a relational um, practice-based ways of, of being in the world informed very powerfully by, by, by histories um, and uh, but always uh, also uh, you know, not determined by those histories. Um, and mm. so, so I think there's, there's fantastic work going on trying to um, get, a, find alternatives to that, the, to the, the brain-centered, um, machinically animated um, ways of, of thinking about intelligence. Um, I don't think that's going to happen within the project of artificial intelligence until and unless, um, and, and another person, writer I would point to is, is Phil Avery, um, who wrote a book, Computation and Human Experience. Um, Phil, Phil is an AI person um, developing ideas of what he calls a critical technical practice, which are really wonderful. And, and um, 
but but not dominant, I would say. Uh, so I think until, you know, to me, um, the so I, I've thought about this quite a bit in relationship projects in um, in care care robots and you know uh, ways in which AI is going to solve um, the problem of you know those of us who are getting older and you know are such a burden and there aren't apparently aren't enough people to be caregivers, which uh, I think we should question. But until it moves from the idea of building sort of human-like machines that will act as caregivers to projects in design that together with caregivers, recipients of care, um, roboticists, uh, other kinds of technologists kind of think together about mm -hmm. where interesting artifacts could be introduced, incorporated into practices of care. And there are, uh, there are undoubtedly many, many places where that's the case, but that's a complete kind of inversion of, so rather than, you know, the, yeah. the individual machine uh, that, that, is, that is the sort of, you know, replica uh, of, of a certain conception of the human caregiver, it's a, it's a, a kind of much more um, artful integration of, of practice artifacts in consultation with people who are directly uh, informed and affected by it. And that's just a totally different project. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. Oh well, that on that on that charming note, um, <laughs> uh, maybe this is a good time. I think we probably talked far longer than we should have, um, but maybe there's some. We've still got a bit of time for people to um, to ask some questions. And uh, thank you so much. It was uh, it's certainly a, a delight for me to <laughs> to to have prepared and to have thought about this, but also to be to be in conversation with you. So thanks, Lucy. Thanks, likewise. Thank you both. I'm going I'm to keep you spotlighted for a couple of seconds, just so I can, um, on behalf of everyone here, just to thank you both for such a really interesting and rich conversation. You absolutely didn't talk for too long. It was fascinating. Um, there's a few questions in the chat. So um, if, if we'll start with those and if, if Scott and I can manage those together. So um, I'm going to unspotlight you two brilliant people and then just invite anyone to and ask questions in any way that we've got about 20 minutes so you can raise a hand you can speak out and we'll we'll just manage that as we go along okay I'm thanks Kate okay. Oh, sorry, Lucy, it's taken me longer. <laughs> You're like really no spot on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the um Charlie, are you still are you are you with us still? You're yes, I'm here. I'm not even gonna attempt to read your question, Charlie. I'm gonna be very <laughs> mean and I'm gonna hand over to you and ask you sure. if you want to pose your question yourself or your comment. Sure. I, I'm just I was really interested by when you were talking about the the observable eye and where the observable eye was placed or where it was situated um, in the in terms of the AI algorithm. And I, and I and I was thinking about how when AIs are developed, they are usually developed via some sort of machine learning process um whether that's supervised unsupervised or, or reinforcement learning and and i was thinking about the body in that process in that imagined environment um in that uh, essentially a lot of the time when we're speaking about body we're thinking about something physical or something um imagined but it's almost always related to something in physical space or 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 imagined space <laughs> and um, and I'm wondering, uh, particularly thinking about the idea of consciousness and, uh, and all of those sort of complex things that come along with uh, with subjects that are coming into AI around sort of sentience and everything. Um, where in this process does the body emerge? You know, in the because eventually we are talking about something that translates from written language into a physical embodied space through a robotic 
imagining or, 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 or something along those lines. And so I was finding something really interesting in, in that translation process is that we are, is, are we creating body? Are we, you know, where is the body in that, in that process? Is it purely physical? Does it have to be physical? Can it be imaginary with regards to these AI algorithms? I'm thinking about things like a, a Markov decision process and all of those kinds of things. Yeah, so I guess the way I think about the first, first of all, the the idea that consciousness will be emergent from these processes is a is a ongoing, <laughs> um, an ongoing act of faith, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I think what's the way I think about these systems is that there, there's a con there, there are continuities and there are bodies, as I said before, everywhere. So I think about the many, many, many bodies that are involved in these systems, from data labeling to you know all of the people working on the computation, the hardware, the you know people whose whose traces of their lives have provided the material for the data. Yeah. You know, so so there's like you know thousands of bodies all over the place and there are also of course the the the, the bodies of the of the machinery um you know the the material configurations of the machinery and um you know the 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 data servers and so so there's just you know it's just this enormous popul it's populated um mm. and the the and so I maybe I for me it's more thinking about it as these are about translations. These are about re reconfiguring um, the the kind of moving location of 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 the body. And and of course part of the critique is that is about the erasure of all of the the many laboring bodies in the service of the figuring of these systems as as the body, um, you know, thus the, the locus. Uh, so, it, and this maybe goes back to this idea that, that you know, the body is a, is a construct um, that is, uh, you know, more and less, well, that is very consequential. And part of what, what we're doing from our different locations is, is, is thinking about how that construct shows up for, for us and in the worlds that we're engaged with, and um, and what's what what are the effects of different ways of constructing the body, um, rather than trying to sort of pin down, you know, where the real body, <laughs> where the real body is, uh, where where or you know where the the bodies are buried, I guess we could say, in the case of AI, um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Lucy. Scott, you've put a comment in next. Do you want to ask that? Oh, I can make it brief because I can get on to Matthew's. Yeah, maybe um, if you pass on us yours, that would be great. I will. When I'm, um, um, uh, Lucy, I just, when you said, um, you talked about fueling the imaginative project of robotics, so I, I wondered how could it be less fueled? But um, you gave an answer, really. I thought in the very end, you talked about design processes that would involve more people. The artful integration you mentioned. And and I think I would I would agree that would be one one way to feel it uh, less. I've also read uh, Rolf Pfeiffer, you know Rodney Brooks' work. So you kind of get a sense that this bottom up intelligence idea has this tendency to appropriate the senses for its own, you know, robotic project. And I think um, I, I think your work, you know, and your your work and re human re machine reconfiguration and reading some of that also helped me along this path of. This kind of direction of travel and thinking about that as a way of also, you know, what are these differences that you spoke about initially? Um, but if you had if you had something else to say, but I think you did you did offer an answer with this idea yeah. of integrating people uh, on that project. Yeah, I mean, a lot of my, you know, my my work has taken multiple paths, and on the more design side, it's been very much about participatory design and co-design and um, uh, that movement to coming out of Scandinavia to, um, to, to radically change who 
whose knowledge is informed design projects and, and in whose interests um, they're done. Uh, but, and I think, you know, the other thing about, about um, pushing back for me is, is asking, um, you know, wh who, what is this for? Um, what is the problem for which this is the solution? Who wants this? And really tracking the political economies of that. And, um, you know, how is the problem being framed? How might it be framed differently? If it were framed differently, what radically different kinds of projects would be <laughs> funded and pursued? Um, so, so not accepting the fact that um, the problem as framed, uh, which is will always be one of data, um, is you know the, the resisting that kind of translation of everything into data, um, you know everything into the the particular kind of nail for which this is is the hammer. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, then following me in the chat was uh, Matthew. You were your question there. Are you, would you like to speak up and address that wherever you are? If he's not there, maybe he's left. Um, I don't know if you can see, but it says here, um, Mathieu, I'll, I'll read it out for you, is one of the differences between AI and organic life is how they learn and change. So the differences between AI and organic life, has it something to do with the nature of re the, the relationship that they embody the environment? Does AI built, nurture, determine relationships the way organic life does? That AI in that sense doesn't have a body. And then he quote, he references Simone Weil thought that the true imagination could never be disembodied. So I rather um, think that's in line. <laughs> I think the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> Uh, yes, I mean, I think that that is that is um, those are the differences that we need to 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 hold on to, not um, again as the kind of essential basis for claiming human exceptionalism, but as the historical um, and you know prehistorical uh, temporal process and you know temporal and spatial processes out of which the beings um, that there are in the world have emerged and 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 taking those histories seriously and um, and not letting them be um, be erased which is another one of the kind of moves um, that that uh, that AI is so good at, at, at making great thank you. There, there are no other questions in the chat. So I, I guess if anybody now wants to raise a hand, if anything's coming up from that part of the conversation or a comment, even it doesn't have to be a question, but feel free to jump in. Try and, there's a lot of you, so I'll try and keep a lookout for hands or unmuting. Hey, we've got well. We've got about ten minutes. I don't know, Simon or Scott. Or Lucy, uh, Lucy, why do you think? Why do you think they? I mean, this is probably a very simple question. Why did they? Why do they go for intelligence, artificial intelligence, and not artificial wisdom or artificial <laughs> common good or artificial understanding? What, what is it about? What was it about intelligence in the fifties or you know, as I say, those boffins back then and probably before then? Was it? Um, yeah, is it just about being math and mathematicians and a kind of way of thinking about the world? Yeah, I think I think it's a kind of um, it it it's the closest it it's it's part of again it's part of a tradition um, of, of thinking about uh, intelligence in terms of 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 logic um, of abstraction generalization. Um, classification. So, so I think that 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 the project of AI comes out of the same lineage that uh, that what I think of as cognitivism, um, mm. you know, comes out of. And so it's you know you've got people who are 
who are fascinated with the capabilities of, of computation and computational machinery, um, for whom those capabilities um, align with their commitments for how to think about human cognition. Um, and so, so yeah, it's, it's just, it, 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 these things are sort of born of the same um, uh, origins, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're compatible from, from the beginning. Uh, and, and, you know, and again, it, it, it has to do with all these erasures that we've been talking about. Um, of of the body of the, of, of worlds. Um, yes. And I, I I did enjoy reading that John McCarthy's really didn't like the word artificial. Was quite happy with the word intelligence because what they were looking for was was real intelligence. Real intelligence. Yeah. Yes. The, the artificial <laughs> the word was the artificial word was the problem, but that was just they had to go with something. Was the kind of the way in which I read the story anyway. So so. Yeah. I mean, maybe I could ask the last question if <laughs> we have a few more minutes. Um, please, please. And, because I'm curious about whether you or anyone here um, is interested in experimenting with C's ways of incorporating some versions of AI technologies into your into your own dance practice. Um, I mean, we heard that really interesting talk um, by Kate and Harmony about about the ways in which um, they were using uh, motion sensing to to do kind of reconstructions and of dance and the, and the limits of that. And, but, but I wondered if there are others who are. I, I certainly imagine there are, and I let them talk, but um, in uh, on the 20th of April, actually, 28th of April, Marco Donnarumma is a, and Donnarumma is a, um, uh, a choreographer who specializes in working with AI systems uh, as a practitioner, and he's going to be in conversation with Chairman Akarato. Uh, so that's on the 28th. So it's certainly someone who's deepened that world. Um, yeah. And uh, maybe, maybe one more thing I could say about that, because in my papers in the subject object paper, but in other papers, I always, when I'm looking for positive alternatives to the kind of mainstream AI, I always turn to the arts because <laughs> that's where mm -hmm. people are are playing, are, are exploring. And um, so I talked about Xia Jin Wei, who's done these um, instrumented dance environments um, and has a wonder what, wonderful ways of talking about them that are non-AI ways of talking about what's going on. Yeah. Um, but 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 the main point that I I make um, is in, and when I was teaching I would use the example from the from the production um, Warhorse Warhorse oh, yeah. uh, so where where um, the humans and the puppets are co-present um, on the stage and so one of the things that's that's so beautiful is rather than the horse being animated um, in the stage productions, rather than the horse being animated and, and the humans obscured, um, it, is, it is the choreography of the human puppeteer and the puppet that is so very beautiful to watch. And it's another one of these subject object things where you're constantly sort of moving, your attention is moving between them and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, and so it's that kind of, that kind of, um, experimentation with new ways of uh, new distributions of agency um, is one way to think about it that can be affected by incorporating some of these technologies into um, into an art in, into an arts practice um, that is another maybe another you know besides just say no which is kind of <laughs> you know what my earlier um, response was you know it's another way of um, demonstrating a, a very different approach to thinking about um, the possibilities for, for yeah, it's like the removal of hidden layers in a way. Yeah, yeah, and it's actually kind of playing with the relations and the differences and the dynamics of those relations yeah, and differences yeah, yeah. rather than trying to explain them. Any last uh, any. Any last thoughts or questions? I could just say very, very briefly, Lucy, that we are, some of us are 
including Simon and others who have been actively working on this kind of link with arts and humanities, linked into the developments in AI and ethics, working together with the computer scientists and robotics, kind of looking for that, mm -hmm. those artful integrations and what they might, nice. they might look. There yeah. is funding in the UK from the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Um, the question sometimes is whether it's funding for the kinds of artful integrations sort of projects, or is it more policy driven? So sometimes, you know, we, we uh, but, but there, is, there is a move in this direction. I find myself sometimes thinking, though a little bit like climate, is it, you know, at what point is it too little too late almost? It's so the things are moving so fast. But never, nevertheless, and I'm looking at Sarah as a colleague, Sarah Wookie is a colleague who's also beginning to have these conversations. So I think we're, you know, we're moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. bringing the arts you know and the humanities more into a, a, a tighter uh, right uh, and, conversation yeah and there the trick is always not to just be a kind of service provider to the technologists um, <laughs> yeah or just advise them on the, the ethical dimensions of what they're doing <laughs> Uh, the arts and service providers. On that note. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to harsh everyone's buzz there. <laughs> um, that's pre pretty much perfect timing. So if I can just um, thank Lucy and Simon again, just really fascinating. I've got so many notes. I couldn't quite formulate a question yeah. at the time. So I'm sure I'll, I'll probably be pestering or lots of us will be things will occur to us afterwards. And thank all of you as well for, um, for joining us and coming along today. It's so lovely to see um, and hear from so many of you. Um, yep, yes. Simon, Scott, um, do you want to add anything? Thank you. I, I just wanted to, to say thank you and, and I look forward to continuing this conversation. Oh, that would be amazing for us. So yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, by the way, I've just put in the chat the, a link to the next conversation, which is with Michael Don Donnarumma. So that's just um, as a follow on to what uh, Lucy was just talking about in relation to the kind of way in which arts practitioners are working with AI systems. But thank you. And thank you, Lucy. Thanks, Kate, for, um, uh, for, for being the host with the most. Thank you. And thank you, Scott, for um, doing the same. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. See you all. Bye, everybody. Thank you.